Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Okay, welcome everyone to the group chat brought to you by Overmark. I'm Daryl, your host, and with me is Imano. Wow, Imano, I haven't heard from you for quite a while. Yeah, man, it's been a, uh, it's been quite a while since what Chinese New Year, right? The last time around was Chinese New Year, was it? Yeah. yeah it's, it's been a while since we last recorded our podcast and honestly it's been really busy uh, for the both of us uh, I've been busy with work and trying to to prepare for our upcoming crash courses Emmanuel are you busy with? Same been busy with work and, and uh, school man yeah but okay la Chinese New Year was pretty it was a pretty good break um, had one or two two days to like just chill out how about yourself how's Chinese New Year bro? Uh, there was a lot of mahjong <laughs> That, that, that it and a lot of hot pot for sure uh time to lose that weight off yeah but yeah. but i think today we have a pretty interesting topic uh both of us we are physics tutors so today's session is going to be quite insightful as we're going to discuss how do you score an a1 for physics so i think physics as a topic by itself there's is i would say at the same time while it might be easy it can be considered very difficult as well. So maybe I'll just let Emmanuel take the lead on this to maybe tell us more uh, physics as a subject, uh, what are the things to look out for and how should we approach physics? Then I'll add on my, my some insights of mine. Mm, okay, I think that generally from what I see, the students who always get the A1s are the ones who are very precise about their answers. So a lot of people get uh, A's, like I think that's quite a, a it's, it's quite a, quite normal like to see a lot of a1s and a2s um but you'll see that you always bump into people with a2 more than a1s i feel that it's very easy to get a2 if like you are um relatively consistent with your work you go and put in a bit of effort here and there you go and do prelim papers more or less if you understand the topics you should be able to get an a2 at least lah. but uh not that many people get a1s so i feel that there's a very big distinction between a1 and a2 those who actually end up getting a1 they are very precise with the way they answer questions. So unlike the A2 students, right? A2, A2 students, they understand the concept, but they're always lacking in their answers. So like if you go and compare like the script, right? Okay, especially for us tutors, we, we get to see it firsthand. Ma, right? We have multiple students and then we can more or less tell who's going to be A1, who's going to be A2. Those who are getting A1, right? You can really see their script is on a different level from like the, the A2s and the B3s. And obviously very different from, from the rest also, lah, right? Who, who don't even uh, get that great. Um, the they, they answers always contain the keywords that they need. And they are always not afraid to write more. That's what I feel. And uh, you start to see that they have clearly done a lot of papers, uh, like uh, exhaustive amounts of papers, um, to the point where they know exactly what the question is looking for. And they can source that key phrase and that keyword and just plonk it into the answer. So I feel that those are the A1 students, like guaranteed ones. And then um, you, if you consider the calculations part, I feel that that's the easiest part of physics because the math is not difficult for physics. It's very, very simple. Like there's no difficult calculus. Like A math kicks the math out of the park in terms of physics. Like, there's nothing difficult about physics math. One. It's very, very simple. Uh, so I feel those who are, are scoring A1s, right? Just the one itself, right? Not A2, uh, A1 only. Uh, they're very good with content, keywords, as well as calculations. Okay, so the, the main thing I, I think I, I would advise to uh, our listeners here will be to focus on the keywords and to make sure that you're very obsessive about getting the mark and getting the credit for that, for how you answer the questions. Because if you just generally understand the concept, then you're like allowing yourself to slack off to an A2. Lah. I feel that there's quite a big difference between the A2 and the A1 students. Yeah. What about you, Daryl? What do you think? Okay, I think I'll go more from a broad base, then I'll try to narrow it down in terms of how do you eventually aim for the A1. I feel like for students out there, we should approach physics not so much chapter by chapter, but team by team. So what I mean is like when we are talking about your Newton mechanics, try not to study each chapter too individually, because one thing you need to realize is that the chapters are all in a way interconnected. So what do I mean by that? If you are talking about kinematics, that's when you first get introduced to acceleration. But you kind of need to know acceleration is used for forces in F equals to MA. Then when you learn about force, it might be related to work done as well. So you see how all the questions, a lot of it in section A, there's usually part A to part E or part F even. So a lot of these chapters are all interrelated. So the first thing you should do is to take your understanding of physics or your revision approach more from a thematic perspective. 
I think physics as a whole, I think like what Emmanuel said, it requires calculation, but that shouldn't scare you off because the calculation needed is rather basic. The most complicated one that I've seen, right, for physics is when we talk about like a chapter in light, for example, then maybe you need to use similar triangles to solve certain angles uh, for that. Or maybe you need to do alternate angles or opposite angles for reflection or refraction questions. Typically, they don't go into your calculus type of stuff. So physics as a whole, while it requires math, it's not something that it should scare you for about, I mean, scare, scare you away lah. I think physics as a whole, if you are starting from ground zero, you have no idea where to start with. A good way to start, I think, is the formulas. Because most physics questions, you do need the formulas to sort of get you started for your calculation. So that is a good point to start with, which is also why I designed like a physics formula sheet to share with everyone, because I thought that that would be a good and very concise way to revise. Uh, overall, that's how I will uh, encourage you to approach physics. Next, I want to talk about some of the study tips that uh, I have in mind, and then maybe we'll get Emmanuel to share for some of his. So over the years, as I worked with a lot of students, I found out how to learn physics effectively. For me, right, it's really about trying to relate physics to an actual application in real life. What I mean by this is like, if we are talking about terminal velocity or acceleration of free fall, I find it very hard to visualize something Oh, sorry, I find it very hard to understand something that I can't visualize. So if I'm talking about like free fall, uh, I might think about, hey, in basketball, right, if there's a jump ball, as the ball goes up, it slows down until a point where it comes to a stationary pause before it starts coming down fast. So, you know, relating it to those sort of instances really helped me to get a better grasp of the concept. For things like electricity, where you can't exactly see or feel it, I think those are the chapters that students tend to struggle more. Uh, I tend to try to use a visualization approach towards those chapters. So overall, when we're talking about physics, while it's good to start off by looking at the formulas, if you truly want to understand the concept, you really need to wrap your head around it. Because when it comes to more difficult questions, the A1 type of questions that are required to solve, it requires understanding beyond just memorizing of your formulas. So I think that is one thing that I would like to highlight in terms of your study tips. Try to understand it and if you can refer to something in real life that helps you to understand the entire dynamics of the physics concept itself. So Emmanuel, for you, what do you think is a good study tip that uh, students should take note of when they're doing physics? I, I always like to think of uh, physics as, like, like you said, like multiple concepts that are just basically tying in together as a big story with, with like a lot of different formulas along the way. Lah. So usually how I get my, my own students to actually like uh, appreciate the content a bit better is to actually guide them along creating mind maps. So within like, let's say a, a particular topic, you should know the key various concepts are inside out and you should be able to derive formulas. You should be able to, to know exactly what is being tested and to predict, in a sense, really like predict what is going to come out. Because after you have done enough practice for, let's say, uh, papers that like, like your prelim papers or end of year papers, you start to realize they're literally like more or less the same. Okay, and there is very little room, right, for the examiners to go and tweak the paper. So even if they tweak the paper, right, it cannot be so different from what you've already been doing. So to give you a simple example, if you consider a hydraulic press, so the first question they can ask you, like the first part, usually go and calculate the magnitude of one of the forces that is unknown for you. So you just use F over A, F1 over A1 equals to F2 over A2. They just solve the first part. Then all my students, right, they will roughly know, okay, I know another question is coming already. What is the work done by the, scan, the second piston? So that's where you, okay, work done by the first piston must be work done by the second piston because of the conservation of energy. So I feel that once you are able to like do this for every single topic, you kind of know exactly what they are testing and, and how they are likely to test it. Then you really, in that sense, are prepared for at least, uh, I would say at least conservatively 80% of the paper, which means there's 20% of room for the examiners to just uh, pull a quick one on you, like do something weird, do something hard. And... Uh, chances are if you understand the concept that 20% will also be manageable so I feel that it's really understanding the focus of the exam understanding the question types getting familiar with that to the point uh, where you can even anticipate the question that's when you really know you're really like gunning for the A really. you're, you're more or less ready you kind of envision the, the paper so for example okay an another just another one uh, because we're, we're doing a lot of my students are now currently doing this um, they've just set for their sec 3 W A G A something like that, and and uh they've been tested on total. Okay, they've been tested on light. 
So if you, if you think about light, right, what can it test you on? Converging lens. Converging lens, you have the six different cases. You must know how to draw each of the case. You must know the characteristics. Other than that, you also have to know like total internal reflection. What are the conditions? Right? So if, you are, if you're having this mental mind map uh, of all of these topics, I think more or less you'll do well eh, because you already kind of predict the questions in your head. You kind of know what's coming up. You know the way to answer it. You know how to approach the question. Like I said, you're just left with 20% that is, uh, that is not very entirely familiar if, you, if the examiners want to pull something uh, tricky out in the exam. So I feel that you just focus on the 80%, which is like paper after paper, you'll start to see it repeat itself. Uh, and, and I personally feel like, okay, for all the students that I've, I've tweeted before who, who were very confirmed A's, uh, they had always done uh, a lot of papers. So my own students, personally, by the time that they hit uh, O-levels, they would have done, okay, the entire TYS, that one is not even negotiable. They must have finished the entire TYS. And more often than not, I'll get them so ready to the point that they've done easily uh, 30, 40 brilliant papers already. So when you reach that level, it's like, what, what else is there? <laughs> what can the examiners throw to you that you have never seen before? And that's how ready you should be for physics. Lah. I would think that it should be the same for math. I, I, or even math is, is more. Lah. I, I would say math might, might even require more practice than that. Like 30, 40 papers is rookie numbers for math. I feel, okay, but physics is slightly different. Physics is like, uh, it takes a bit more effort lah, to go through each paper. Right, because it is, it is multiple different ways that they can test the concepts. And like sometimes the, the nuances in the words uh, and the way you answer certain questions will, will show also like, for physics, but not so much for math. Like. Math is literally like numbers, right? You, you can't argue with that. There's no way to, to, to twist the question that, that much, like, I feel. Yeah. So what do you think about that strategy, Daryl? The, the one where you focus on mind maps and then after that you focus on doing like many papers. Do, do you also have the same approach? Uh, I'll, I'll share from this perspective first. So I, I have a track record that all my private duties has got either A1 or A2, majority A1. But I'll, I'll share the tip and the secret. I think I've mentioned this before in my previous podcast. But for all my students uh, as a whole, they need to complete their TYS at least three times. So how does it work? Three times sounds like a lot, right? Like impossible, right? Okay, the first time they complete it is during SEC 3 and early SEC 4 as they are covering the chapter itself. So like if they're done with, like recently they're done with sound, their homework for my tuition is always the TYS questions. So that's the very first layer where they get the first layer of exposure. After they complete the syllabus, which is usually by June SEC 4, as they are waiting for their prelim papers, they'll do the topical again. So this is the second one, and I'll try to do it in a more thematic way. So it's like a thematic revision. We do the TYS questions and pick up relevant ones. So that's the second time they do it. And after prelims, before your O-level paper itself, from September leading up to your mid-October period, that's when they will do the yearly TYS paper. So that is the third time they will actually do the paper. But this time around, the formatting is different because the questions are not in your chapter itself. You kind of have to identify the question and the topic and the concept being tested and put it together in the exam format that's a bit more time sensitive. So that's the third time that they will be doing the TYS. So overall, that's the number that they'll be doing. In terms of prelim papers, I think it's the same. For me, I try to hit a balance because I know in schools, the sec force, they tend to get prelim papers to do in class. So I'll try to hit a balance between those that I do give them privately in tuition and the amount that they're doing in school. Because a lot of times what the schools do, right, is that they ask you to do in class, then they don't have the time to go through, which is very annoying because if you do and you don't go through, right, there's no point. So what I try to do is to make sure that for every single paper they do, I will mark it for them and we can go through the mistakes. Doing questions that you already know is not important. Doing questions that you do not know how to solve, that's where the value is at and learning how to solve those. So make sure when you do, right, the corrections is where you should be focusing on, not the doing portion. Okay, now down to how I will approach physics as a chapter itself. I think what Emmanuel you shared, I think was super valuable. Uh, just adding on to that, uh, in terms of the revision technique itself, I think that we should not forget to also other than practice itself, it's very important to be able to identify which chapter and which concept is being tested. So let's talk about thermal physics, for example. When you're revising, you need to know in thermal physics, in transfer of thermal energy, there's exactly three concepts you need to know. Your conduction, your convection, and your radiation. So if you ever happen to see a question in the exam, the first thing you need to take note of is that if this is a question that is transfer of thermal energy, you know you need to use either one of the three concepts. Then decide which one is the correct one you need to describe. Then you need to recall what are the keywords. So for me, uh, I wouldn't say it's a mind map approach exactly, 
But how I look at it is like each chapter, there are certain key concepts. So I try to match the correct concept to the question. Then from there, it's a lot easier to derive what exactly is needed for me to solve that question. So I mean, a lot of instances for that. Like if you talk about static electricity, the application of static electricity, there's your spray painting, there is your printer with the, with the, with the toner, as well as your precipitator. So it's like the questions can't revolve that much from whatever is seen because your syllabus, there's a limited learning outcome in terms of what you need to know. So they can't test you things that are beyond that. And the permutations of questions, if you have done enough practices, you would be able, or you have seen it before when it comes in the exam. So overall, I think I, I largely agree with the strategy on like, you need to know your chapters. You can build either a mind map or you can do, design your own notes or your school notes. For me, I designed the curated notes in a very specific fashion whereby I take out all the useless stuff. I need to keep the key concepts that you need to know in the book. So it's very clear in terms of a very optimized revision kind of strategy. Okay, I think enough on the revision part. I think we have shared enough on the importance of practice, the importance of identifying the key concepts and mind mapping it out. Okay, now let's say, right, uh, we are now before a test or before an exam itself. Emmanuel, how should students revise? I personally would ask them, right, to go and look through their notes. Then the first step is always to just come up with a little, a little piece of, uh, I, would, I would call it a mind map. Lah. They should come up with handwritten like notes uh, just once at least for each topic that you're being tested on. So for example, if you, have a, if you have a team test on electricity, like some of you are starting to learn electricity in school now. So like as you're progressing along uh, this period where, where you're about to sit for your test, you should be doing revision on the, the definitions, the formulas, the common question types and the keywords that you need to use for each of that one part, each topic lah, that you're being tested on. Then collate all the formulas also. And then that's when you're ready to start doing the practice questions. Because if you, if you jump right into the practice questions without reading or revising, right? First off, you won't do well uh, for your own practice and you won't understand where you're getting lost at. You'll be very lost doing the questions. It, it, it basically will be a big waste of your time. What you should do first, right? Is definitely go and identify the key concepts, the keywords and the formulas and give yourself a, a good fighting chance, right? To be able to complete like questions. Then once you're done with that, you attack the questions, right? And make sure you know where you keep going wrong at. So a lot of times, a lot, I think a lot of students also, they put the wrong emphasis on the effort. So you keep thinking like, okay, I, uh, like some of them have the mental framework of, okay, I need to do two to three test papers today. If I do that, I'm productive. But very little time is spent on reviewing and retaining information. And very little effort is spent on that. But that is where you should focus on, right? If you think about the value add of practicing, it's not in the actual practice itself. It's in the learning from the mistakes that you've, you've, you've made. So if you are one of those um, students who've been constantly thinking like, okay, the way I am productive is if I manage to complete this amount of papers, I strongly urge you to go and try to change that mindset and think, okay, I'm productive if I have learned and I have mastered this question type. And every time it comes out, I'm confident that I can get and secure the marks. That is when, right, you, you know you're really learning. You're not doing things mindlessly. Because a lot of you guys are doing things mindlessly, right? You're just uh, doing paper after paper after paper. And you find the satisfaction in, in, in saying, hey, I've completed this paper today. But that's not how learning works. You should be focusing on, okay, I've mastered this concept today. I've mastered this kind of question time. If it ever comes out in the exam again, I will know exactly how to answer it and I know how to get the A. I don't know how to solve that. So uh, back to the, the overarching question. You should, first of all, create your notes, get the content in your head, get the formulas ready. Second, go and attempt those practice papers. Attempt questions, practice questions. This, this should include uh, a range uh, like MCQ as well as your open-ended. And finally, right, the most crucial part is not attempting the question, is marking and reviewing. Okay, so that's the third step. Marking, reviewing, making sure that you know where you get. Uh, where you always get your careless mistakes, where you always lack in terms of your answers. And if you have mastered these, these three fronts, right, and you've gotten the, the strong answering ability, then you're good to go for, for this test. Lah. I feel that is your strongest fighting chance to get a very, very solid grade. That's when you know okay, you're, you're ready, you're, you're, done, you're, you're, you're done with the revision for the test. I think for me, I'm going to drop this golden tip. I, I don't usually share this, but for listeners that are still tuning in at this point, right, this is a reward for you. If it was me, right, how would I revise before a test? I'll take out either the 10 year series or my prelim papers. I'll read through the answers. Why do I do that? So when I teach, right, I don't like to teach solutions, which is how do you solve this question? 
I like to teach an approach. How do you solve this type of questions? So I don't narrow down because every question, it can be structured slightly differently while applying the same concept. So the focus on practicing is not regurgitation as Emmanuel has said. It's not about doing, about, it's not about volume. It's really about learning and internalizing that. And for me, it's really about learning the approach. Let's talk about a very recent topic that I'm teaching, echo in sound, right? So in sound, right, it's easy to understand, hey, echo is just in this, you travel the distance twice. But that is just at a base level. You have that, you can solve an easy question. But let's say if you meet a more difficult question, how do we approach such a question? So for me, I'll teach my students, you need to identify distance one and distance two. Because in some questions, there might be two walls. The speaker might be a certain distance away from the human being. You hear the first echo and then, oh, sorry, you hear the first sound and then you hear a second echo that bounces off the wall. So you really need to internalize, okay, how do I solve this type of questions? So the approach is more important than the solution itself. And when you read through the answer sheet, especially for section A and section B questions, you can really see the working that's being laid out for you. Like, okay, this is how I solve this question. This is a formula that I need to use. So that is my shortcut where I'm studying. I, if I really don't have enough time, I'll look through the answers because the answers itself gives me the fastest way to absorb the information that I need. Okay, so that is something if like before the exam, you need to revise, that's something that I encourage. Obviously, you can't do this without knowing your content. So what Emmanuel has said, you need to build out like at least an A4 summary of each chapter. I think that is the sort of like the thing you need before you enter the exam. That is like basic. If you don't have it, you're in trouble. Let's say if you really have that and you're entering the exam hall, other than looking at the answer sheet, something else I'll encourage is to study the chapter that you're bad at. When you do practices, right, questions that you get correct is not important. The questions that you get wrongly are the one you should like try to like frame it up or keep it somewhere such that before the paper itself, right, before your exam, you can go and look back at those questions that you did wrongly. Because if you can't do it then and you can't do it now, you're not going to be able to do it in the exam. So what you need to do is you need to identify questions that you can't do, concepts that you're weaker at, save those question types and make sure you revise and approach those. So something that you need to learn right early on is to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So what do I mean by that? If you're uncomfortable, you, you really don't like electromagnetism. You know, it's a topic that scares you. That's good because now you know what you're afraid of and what you're bad at. If you're really good at a chapter already, there's no point doing more of it because you really know how to do it. So spend your time in where you're uncomfortable. So really go and invest more time to understand and practice those chapters that you're weaker at. So that will really make a very big difference because if you're uncomfortable with the chapter, likelihood other students are also uncomfortable. So that is really where you differentiate the A1 from the B3 and the A2 students. It's those harder questions that students tend to avoid. So you might pray that, okay, please, please, please. I just pray that the question come out in the either or, then you know I can ignore it, things like that. Don't, don't hope for that. If you're uncomfortable with lenses, make sure you spend more time on it. If you're uncomfortable with uh, electromagnetic induction, you don't like your transformers and stuff, make sure you do more questions until a point where you're comfortable. If you're comfortable, then that's when you know you're ready. Okay, so I think we shared really a lot of tips, uh, very specific to physics itself. And I think that's the goal of this podcast as well. Uh, maybe before we move on to the dilemma of the week, right? Emmanuel, maybe you can share with us based on your tutoring experience like, as a teacher POV, what are some of the chapters that students tend to struggle with or areas that they struggle? Like which chapters or which teams, you know? Okay, uh, I would say one of the harder ones would be static, static electricity. So a lot of them actually struggle with this because it's a very wordy topic. Like it's not like your usual like heat, like thermal, thermal physics, like calculation kind of question. You know what I mean? There's those calculation kind of question you can grind through and you can like just keep doing and then make sure you know the four formulas, uh, four or five formulas that you need to know. You know how to piece the formula together and then you can solve it already. For static electricity, it's very, it's very different. You need to know the drawings. You need to know why the few lines are drawn the way they are. You need to know what the few lines mean. You need to know how to charge and how to talk about the movement of electrons. So personally, to us, I feel like to us teachers, we, we always think it's quite simple, lah, right? But the first time you're learning this as a student, I, I can see why you, you get visibly confused. Like how come like uh how come we always draw only a few number of um plus and minus? Does that mean that if uh I don't draw a minus sign, there are no charges there at all? 
uh, this kind of weird concepts, right? You, you should actually go and think a bit harder about it. And then if you're not sure, then go and clarify your tutors. Just, just to answer that, uh, to, to remind you all, no, we are only, whenever we draw the plus and minus, we are drawing the excess charges. Okay? So this is one of those content where you, you really do need to internalize and read up a bit more so that um, like the more conceptual and difficult questions, right? You'll be able to easily like understand what's going on. Then I think um, there are also mentioned stuff like the precipitator, the photocopying machine, the spray painting machine. Like you also need to understand how these work. But more importantly, right, you need to treat this, this one particular topic uh, from physics very different from the rest. Because the keywords really, really matter more than any other topic uh, for physics. And if you're weak in, in this kind of topic, you, you kind of can tell that uh, you grasp the concept, but your answers are very weak because you don't have the keywords. So I think one very, very good point that uh, Daryl actually suggested was to go and look through the answer key. Because when you look through the answer key for, let's say, uh, static electricity kind of questions, then you'll constantly see recurring like keywords. So you know that in the future, you must talk about those keywords. You must have that in your answer in order for you to obtain the mark. So this is, this is okay, I would say this is one, personally, right, for my students, right, this is one of the topics where uh, I see a lot of them struggle. Uh, because, okay, at our center, right, a lot of them actually go for, for math classes uh, under my, my colleague. Um, so they, they usually don't have any problem with calculation-based questions. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to static electricity, it's a refreshing, like, what, what's going on, what's going on kind of thing. So I, I feel that this is one of uh, the topics where you have to be a bit cautious. There's a different, a slightly nuanced kind of study method that uh, you would have for this one particular topic that is different from the rest. That's my, my take on it. Um, other than that, there are some very, very fundamental uh, like topics that a lot of people just struggle to get because it's not well explained uh, in certain schools. And uh, the teacher that usually doesn't have enough time to go through very in-depth. For example, Newton's third law. I know this is a very big misconception. Like so many people like get this wrong, right? And then when they go to JC, then they're like, oh, so that's what my teacher meant the last time around. Yeah, so I, I think that, okay, it, it really makes sense for you to consider uh, and probe a bit deeper on, on as to why, like, uh, or what the, the whole concept means. So uh, one very big misconception is if, let's say, there are two bodies, right, and, and they're exerting a force on each other. I, I've, always trick, I've always asked my students this trick question. So there's a force on one body, there's a force on another body, then don't they cancel out? Then no resultant force really, right? Then everybody gets very confused. They're like, Hey, yeah, what he's saying is correct. Huh? The two forces equal and opposite, so they cancel out. Right? Okay, but no, this doesn't happen, right? Because they're acting on two different bodies. So obviously, it doesn't cancel out, right? You, you must know uh, you must know the definition of Newton's law and how that actually makes sense. So whenever I'm teaching this, right, I actually go one level up. I try to bring like the, the RJ definition in because they when they define it for you in A levels, right, it's crystal clear. Like then you really understand, oh, this is why it happens. Okay, for example, the RJ definition is, okay, if object A exerts a force on object B, object B will exert a force equal in magnitude opposite in direction of the same kind on object A, right? So in other words, it's super clear, right? And you realize, oh, you only learn this in, in JC. Then in, in O-levels, you are, you're just left like, what's going on? What's going on? So for those kind of key concepts, right? Uh, go and read your textbook. They give a lot of examples on that. Then if you're interested, go and find out, like go and search more videos on that law. I feel that on YouTube, right, it's a very, very vast platform for you to learn about this. Then here's another crazy one. I always tell this to, to people, then they get very shocked. Like, for example, if, and some of the textbooks are, uh, not textbooks, some of the papers that you see from schools are actually wrong. Like, they draw a little, uh, they draw a man, right, who's standing on earth. So there's the weight acting down on him, and then there's a normal contact force acting up on him. Then they ask you, is this a normal, or uh, is this an action-reaction pair? So, a lot of people will be like, yeah, lah, it cancels out, right? Then, but it's not. It's not actually reaction there. So you should go and read uh, a bit more in-depth onto like the most trippy concepts. So I feel that, okay, very, very, good, very, very fun question to tackle, Daryl. Uh, there are definitely very, very, very nuanced, very niche kind of little misconceptions that I feel that one day, right, maybe we should just create a video like to fix all the very, very common misconceptions that everybody dies with. So the first one will be static electricity. Like, how come got some plus or some minus? Then do the protons move? Wow, that one always tilts me when my students say that. Okay, then here's another one, the, the uh, Newton's third law. So these are the more difficult concepts. Lah. So I feel that, yeah, I, I think we should schedule something like that. Like one day we should go through like the most disgusting kind of questions like that. Then we should record it, put it on YouTube. Then everybody will be like, oh, so, so that's what they meant in the textbook. Yeah, like I don't top, know, I think that's fun. Top 10 yeah. killer questions at O-levels.
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Let's work on it. Let's work on it. Sounds fun, huh? Sounds fun. Yeah, I, but I completely agree, you know. It's like, while Newton's third law, even some of them know it's equal and opposite, they do not know it must be the same type of force. So it's like so many like yeah, yeah. intrinsic stuff that you can only teach like uh, if the student understand the concept. I think for me, most of the students that, I won't say struggle, but uh, they tend to have a harder time is current electricity and DC circuits. I always come back to a point where by electricity, I think if you practice enough, you can still get a hang of it but it's very difficult for you to understand the chapter for the reason that electricity cannot be felt and it cannot be seen. So it makes it very tricky compared to thermal physics or kinematics, whereby those are things that you can experience or feel to a certain extent. So for those more difficult and more abstract chapters like electricity or DC circuits, uh, how I approach it or how I encourage students to approach it, right, is to really visualize. So I always use the same example that I always teach in all my tuition and crash courses. It's like the charge is like the Pikachu. The Pikachu has electrical energy. It goes around the circuit. It goes through the light bulb and then it goes back to the Pokemon center, which is the battery to recharge. So, so those are the ways that I think really help students visualize something. For example, in DC circuits from series to parallel, it splits into two paths, right? So why would current be larger in one path compared to the other, you know? So that, that's a logic that might not flow with certain students. So for me, it's like, it depends on the resistance. So if you have higher resistance, less Pikachu want to go down that path because everybody choose the path of least resistance. So that can also help to uh, explain what's an open circuit. So I feel like being a teacher or as a tutor myself, my goal is not so much just to regurgitate knowledge so that other students, like students uh, can learn what I already know is about being able to explain it in a way where students can understand. So if you ever find yourself revising and you really don't understand a certain point, right? Take it, take the chance to go and clarify with a friend that knows or clarify it with a teacher. Okay, the thing with teachers is that, right? You need to understand the struggle of teachers in school because it's a one is to 30 or one is to a 40 class. The teacher don't have the time to slow down and explain it to each individual. But you realize that most teachers, they are very open to consultations after lesson. So, you know, if you are struggling with this chapter, right, book a time with your teacher, talk to the teacher and run through those concepts again. Trust me, they'll be able to explain it much better one-to-one -one because you can clarify your doubts and whatsoever. If you really find yourself struggling, I mean, it's not meant to be a promotion, but the crash course is really meant to help you pick up on these nuances and these smaller details and go through commonly tested questions. So it's designed to be like a one-time session, not to go through everything in depth, but to highlight and, you know, help you enhance your learning before your exam itself. So you can do, you can consider that. Like, I mean, not everybody have the luxury of going for tuition, but uh, I think the crash course is just a very good alternative because it's just a one-time thing. And then with the curated notes, you can really revise a lot more if you want to. But if you don't need it, then I mean, up to you. But if you find it that it might be helpful, I think do consider it. Okay, I think enough of our insights and sharing about where students tend to struggle. I think that is so relatable. When you're speaking about well, the static, well, why the electron moves, not the proton, then it's like, okay, for me, it's a bit more interesting because I teach chem as well. So in chem, it's the same thing, the electron transfer for the ions, but the protons stay in the nucleus. So a bit more relatable on the end. Uh. Okay, for the dilemma of the week, let's assume, right, this student... Before the exam, he is a B3 student, okay? He or she is a B3 student, which means they got some of the basics down, but not enough of it, like sufficient. Should they revise the textbook or should they do more practices? You have to choose either or. So that's the dilemma of the week. So let's say one day before the exam, should they do practice or should they revise the textbook? Practice for sure. I think with a B3, you understand the main concepts really. And then what you're looking to do now, right, to get yourself to the A is to to see where, which questions would cause you to trip. So when you are doing the questions, if you're still B3 standard, at least you should be getting, what, 65% of it, right? So the, the remaining uh, 35%, go and see where you went wrong. See where your answer is lacking and then fix it. Then I feel that you have a much, 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 much better shot at getting to an A. As compared to like reading the textbook and then knowing what you already know, right? Like for example, if you're B3, you already know, like, like you know the most, obvious things that your textbook list. So when you're, when you're attempting the question, it's, it's a waste of your time, lah, I would say. So my opinion, 100%, go ahead and attack the questions. I, I think I'll largely agree with that. I think just flipping your textbook, right, is a very inefficient way of studying. Because, right, most of the time, trust me, right, you start from chapter one. 
So actually, right, you, you always revise the first few chapters multiple times compared to the chapters at the back, which are the ones that are usually taught at a later stage and the ones that you're not as confident of. I agree with Emmanuel, go do your practices. But what's more important here is not to spam the practice mindlessly. But after you do the practice, identify which are the question types that you're getting wrongly. Look at the answer sheet, look at your textbook, see what went wrong. So the focus at that stage before the exam, let's say you are three months, two months, one month away from the exam, do the practice, focus on where you get your questions wrong. If you already have your thermal physics grounded, you're like, screw this man, latent heat of vaporization, bring it on. Don't care about thermal questions anymore. Any extra practice you do is just a reaffirmation of what you learned. Focus your time more on like waves or light, those topics that you are struggling with. So before your exam, go and study those chapters that you're not confident of, okay? Another thing to highlight is that there are certain free marks and those are really up to you to study. For example, what is the principle of conservation of energy? So that is literally a one mark that you can get if you know it. If you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, the answer you write will be like, like a joke, okay? Another thing is like when you're studying those very specific uh, keywords kind of answers, right? Make sure you really get the keywords grounded, highlight it or underline it, okay? So for example, let's talk about total internal reflection. So it has to be traveling from a optically denser medium to a optically less dense. A lot of students just say travel from denser to less dense. But we need to remember, right? Density is mass over volume. Optical density is the one that affects the speed of light in the medium. So those very niche keywords, you make sure you, you get it grounded and then you remind yourself. Same thing as compression and rarefaction. It's not rarefraction. Because normally you learn compression and then you learn light. Then you are, okay, refraction and rarefraction. Then you, you get the keywords mixed up. Then you spell it wrongly. So those are like very small things, but those things are the one that you should remind yourself more before the exam not the general formula, okay? So uh, that being said, uh, if I were just to throw in one more, because I, I feel like I want to like say as much as I can, if you do F equals to MA, remember F is not force, but resultant force, okay? Very important. So you need to account yeah. for all the different forces. I always tell the my kids to remember it, memorize it as RF equals to MA, not, not F equals to MA. Wow. Oh my God, bro, I relate to that so much. <laughs> I, I, sh I show you all the students that I taught last year during my physics crash course, right? That I emphasize that like three times. Like, it's not force. It is resultant force. Yeah. So like all these small things, make sure you go and pick up on it early because it can really save that one, two mark, one, two mark. Then suddenly your grade bump up from a B3 to A1. Okay. Mm. So I think we, we shared really so much about physics and it's really for you to take away from this and apply it to your own learning. That's how you can really improve yourself to try to score the A1. The A1 mark, I don't think is something that is unrealistic or something that's unattainable. But like what Emmanuel said at the very start of the podcast, the students that can get A1 are those that know exactly what they're doing. So you, they already know what kind of questions might come up. They already know what are the tricky parts that they can possibly make the mistakes at. So if I have one last statement to, to share is that if you want to ever get an A1 confidently, you need to be able to think like a teacher you need to think of, okay, if I'm setting this question, what are the things that I want to test and what are the areas that students that are not familiar with the concept might make mistakes at? If you're able to reach that standard and you're able to teach somebody else how to solve this question or what are the areas that you know people tend to make common mistakes at, then you know for certainty you can enter the exam hall confidently and excited to solve the entire paper with confidence. Yeah, Emmanuel, do you have any things to share? I think that was very, I really, really agree with that. Like really do your best, try to think of how like the teacher would set the paper. And then yeah, la, do enough practice to the point where you can kind of foresee what's coming up. I feel that that's when you're really ready. Agree, agree, agree. And then I think the main thing that we've been uh, harping on here is attention to detail. Like that really separates you from uh, A2 if, you're, if you want to be an A1. Attention to detail really matters here. And like the choosing the right keywords, like, be obsessive with it. I think that that's really what will, set, what will set you apart. Yeah. But I think, yeah, more or less, that is exactly what we wanted to go through for, for this uh, one little podcast. We wanted to show you all like the insights of what um, A1 students should be thinking and doing. And we really hope that this has been beneficial for you. Uh, I feel that this is probably one of the more valuable, super like niche kind of topics uh, that we should discuss more like 
for future podcasts as well. So like, do do let us know your feedback. We are always more than happy to like tweak um our discussions to something that you're listening, uh, you're interested in listening to lah. I feel that that's that's what we we should really work towards, and we will we will we are more than happy to work with the feedback that you give. Yep. So we will regularly post like questions uh, on our Instagram account to ask for topics that you guys are interested in. So I think one of it was more like niche kind of content. So this was exactly a topic that was picked out, suggested to us by one of our uh, listeners. So they wanted to hear more about physics itself. So we really went in depth to tell you how, what's the trick and the roadmap to getting the A1. Um, Aim high because uh, you need to trust yourself that you're able to do it, but it all starts with effort. Lah. So I think we, we talked a lot about practice itself, but practice is not something that you can achieve in a matter of weeks or months. You really need to pace yourself out and spread the workload over a longer period of time because you need to acknowledge that physics will not be the only subjects that you're taking. So it's very important for you to also spend time on the other subjects. So how you can do this is by starting early. So if you're already learning the chapter in school, go and try your TYS. TYS is not a SEC4 book. It's not that you read SEC4, then you can do the book. If you learn the chapter in SEC3, you are already able to do it in SEC3. So go and try the questions every single chapter on pace with your school. By then you complete the TYS once. When it comes to June, you have another time to practice and then you do your yearly paper. If you do it three times, trust me, you can at least get an A already. With sufficient prelim paper and exposure, that's when you can actually aim for the A1. Okay, It's something very realistic and it's something that requires effort and also diligent learning not just regurgitation or blindness effort. Okay, I mean, we, we want to stop here because I feel like we're rambling already, but those are really heartfelt advice for all of our listeners out there. So if you enjoyed the podcast, please follow us and also continue to give us suggestions on Instagram. You can even drop us a PM if you have been enjoying our podcast and you want us to share on a particular topic. I think we are more than happy to do so because what we're trying to do here is really to give you valuable tidbits and information that you enjoy. Okay, with that, we'll come to the end of the podcast. Thank you for tuning in and we will look forward to the next episode. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. It sound right, boy.